Good morning. Or if you're watching this online, hello. It could be any time, wherever you are. So very, very happy to see you. Happy New Year. It's the 2nd of Jan. Is anyone excited about the new year? You don't have to be. I feel like this new year has been a little bit... uh, Just sort of a little bit, yeah, I guess we're in the new year. Hooray, I guess. I think we're happy about it. I'm not sure. I think it's good to be excited, and we're very, very pleased if you are excited, but it has been a challenging, well, two years now for many of us, hasn't it? And I think it's important for us to actually acknowledge that, to take a moment to recognize that. It's been a really, really, really tough couple of years for everyone. We've all been affected by the pandemic, by what's going on. Shelly talked a little bit about setting personal goals earlier. I'm at that point now where my personal goal for 2022 is to stay alive and get through. (laughs) Yep, anyone else? Yeah, a few people, because it's like that. You know, you can set goals, but who knows what's going to happen. I would just like to get through. Um, You know, maybe I'll set the goal of leaving the house once a day. We'll see if that happens. (laughs) That was a joke, but yes, it didn't, yeah, it didn't quite land. I'm sorry about that. Um, But yes, it's been a challenging time. But why don't we take a moment and just pray into that? Lord, as we come into a new year, 2022, as we look back, as we reflect, and as we look forward to the new year, we see that many of us, all of us, have been through a period of challenges, of trials, of suffering, of deep pain in so many different ways, both here in Melbourne and around the world. We ask that your spirit would come and help us to begin to walk through that pain. Not to erase it necessarily, but to help us to learn to grow through it. To develop through it. To come out the other side a little bit scarred, but a little bit stronger. And as we face this new year, as we prepare for what's coming next, we ask that you imbue us with a fresh sense of your presence. Bless us, be with us, so that we may bless others in your name. Amen. Amen. Well, it's pretty appropriate then that our theme for this month is just refresh, right? Because the temptation is to do some big hurrah, like, yeah, let's get excited, let's make all these big plans, let's do all of that. But I think it's actually really good that we're taking this month just to pause just to take some deep breaths and to think about how do we begin refreshing ourselves for this new year? What does the word refresh mean to different people? Well, as Shelley mentioned, I am a Revelation person. (laughs) My doctoral work was in the book of Revelation. And so when you say things to me, that's where my mind goes. And anyone who says refresh to me, I think of the wonderful vision at the end in Revelation chapter 22, verses 1 and 2, the glorious city of God that comes down from the heavens. I'll read it for you. Um, I I deliberately haven't put it up on the screens, so you can't follow along. What I'd like you to do is listen to me reading it. Very ancient practice. This is how the early church would have heard the scriptures, because most of them couldn't read. So you get to hear the scriptures. So I'll start. Then the angel showed me the river of the water of life, bright as crystal, flowing from the throne of God and of the Lamb through the middle of the street of the city. On either side of the river is the tree of life with its 12 kinds of fruit, producing its fruit each month, and the leaves of the tree are for the healing of the nations. What an extraordinary vision of the end of all things. When we come into the presence of God and the city of God is there, not just for us, but for the healing of all the nations. What a wonderful, powerful, majestic hope that we have. That's why I'm a Christian. I hope you are too. Um, But we're not quite there yet. We have a purpose and a mission to fulfill and bring about this inaugurated kingdom of God. So, good, we can look forward to that. 
but we still have to deal with what's here and now. And thinking back to Refresh, I realized it was actually quite difficult in this current season to even pause because we're in a place and a time where our lives have kind of formulated around not really taking breaks. We, we've, we've built ourselves into habits that don't allow us to do these things. So today what I'm going to do is talk about three things. I, I, I wrote this down and I thought, oh, this will be great. And then I realized that I'm actually talking about a lot of stuff. So I apologize for that. Um, you can listen back to it online as the online pastor. I'm definitely going to encourage you to be able to, to, to do that. Um, so three things to talk about. The first is this idea of Sabbath, right? Of taking breaks. Because, like I was saying, in our lives at the moment, we, we, especially because of lockdowns, of working from home, all of these things, we've kind of painted ourselves into a bit of a corner, I feel, where, you know, the first lockdown, we're all like, yay, I no longer have to drive to work if you work from home. Or, you know, there's fewer people on the roads. I don't have to fight through traffic every day, and I've got so much more time. Let's bake sourdough, or I don't know, let's go for walks, or whatever it is we did. But at the same time, we were also a little bit like, oh, well, I've got a bit more time up my sleeve. I'm not commuting as much. I can work for an hour longer at home. And then it becomes an hour and a half. And then it becomes two hours. And you're like, oh, look, you know, I took a little bit of time in the middle of my day to go and hang out the washing. I'll do a little bit of work at 8 o'clock tonight. That's great for the first couple of lockdowns. Multiple lockdowns later, many of us are, f are trapped in these bad habits where all of a sudden work is all encompassing, our mobile devices are always on, we're always reachable, and because everyone else is doing it, we're all contactable at all hours. That's, I don't know if that's healthy. I don't know if that's good for us. I don't know if we haven't built ourselves into this posture where we're unable to take time just to relax and just to be. You see, when God created humans, it tells us in Genesis, he formed humans out of the substance of the earth, the clay, right? But he imbues humans with spirit. He breathes his ruach, his spirit, his breath into humans, which means that we are physical beings, but we are also spiritual beings. And any person who has ministered for a little while will tell you this. If you are physically tired, that affects your spirituality. And if you are spiritually tired, it can also have a detrimental effect on your physical being, right? You can end up being depressed if you're giving out, giving out, giving out, giving out all the time. You can end up exhausted. You can have breakdowns. This is why people burn out. And we want to be very, very wary of that. And so we find a safeguard against this in the texts this idea of a Sabbath, a time of rest and reconnecting with God. Now, we see, of course, that this becomes a little bit legalistic, but the idea is still important that it's okay to take a day. Even God does it. You know, in, in contrast to the creation myths of other cultures at the time, where, you know, such and such cuts such and such's head off and takes the eyes and becomes the sun and the moon and all of that. We don't have that. In the Jewish texts, we have a God who carefully, lovingly creates the world in a very thoughtful, ordered way, and then takes a day off and goes, you know what? That's pretty good. I'm happy with that. Why don't we do the same? We should do the same. In the ancient world, people thought the Jewish people were really, really weird because why would you take a day off? What, what is a day off? You know, many of these, um, the Romans, for example, would work and work and work. I mean, many of them were slaves, so they didn't really have a choice in the first instance. But their life was just, I mean, to use a, a modern term, they're just hustling all the time. They're trying to make that money. They're trying to do what they've got to do in order to survive. Why would you take a day off? So they thought the Jews were really weird. They respected them because they thought, wow, good on you for taking a day off to honor your God. But you know what? We're going to make money instead. We're going, to, we're going to keep building our wealth and keep doing this for ourselves. I think for us today, Sabbath will look very different from person to person. 
but it's helpful to think through what can I do in this season to give myself a moment of rest, of refreshment, to allow God to speak into my life. It might be something like leaving your work computer at work. Radical thought, I realize that. But you know what? It'll still be there tomorrow. You will still be there tomorrow, right? It might be something like putting your phone on flight mode for an evening. It might be something like leaving your phone at home and going for a walk and not listening to a podcast or, or anything, just enjoying the sounds of nature. Unless you live in Baronia like I do, in which case it's usually the sounds of V6s revving really hard. <laughs> well, I guess that's nature in a way. Let's not work ourselves to death because that is not God's vision for us. God's vision for us is humans living fully alive in the image of God. Let's think of ways that we can reclaim that, balance our lives once again. That's all I'll say about that. Others may touch on that in the coming um, few weeks, but have a think about that. Something for you to think about over the next week. What am I doing? Have I got myself into a place where what I'm doing is unsustainable? Can, what can I do to carve out this time and reclaim a little bit? All right, let's now talk about baptisms, another way for people to be refreshed. Baptism, as many of you will know, is an ancient, ancient practice. Right? It symbolizes renewal and it symbolizes cleansing. For Christians, it is a public declaration of our confession of faith in the Lord Jesus as our Savior. Where does it come from? Well, it has close ties to this idea of ritual purity, right, of, of cleansing yourself. Um, so in a nutshell, the, the idea is that God is entirely holy, right? God is very good, very powerful, very holy. Humans are not, <laughs> to put it simply. So humans, therefore, cannot come into contact with God. So in order to do that, there are a number of steps that must be made in order to sanctify, to make humans holy, just for a temporary period, in order to even enter God's presence. And this idea of baptism was one of those things, to physically cleanse yourself. It's interesting because if you look through um, the texts, especially Levitical law, a lot of these washing and, and purifying rituals are what we might today call common sense or good medical practice, things like washing your hands. That's a good idea. Um, you know, if you come in contact with certain bodily fluids, uh, with blood, uh, if you have unusual medical issues, uh, if you touch a corpse or something that is dead, you're required to cleanse yourself. Again, pretty good idea, right? You don't want to contaminate everyone else. And this means that baptism is actually really, really important because not only is it a symbolic, important spiritual act that has religious ideas behind it, it's also a very practical way of protecting the community. All you have to do now is look around. <laughs> We've got our own ways of protecting the community at the moment, haven't we? And they're very, very important. It's interesting, by the way, just a random little aside, that one of the requirements in the Jewish law is that the water used for this type of cleansing is living water, which means it can't be stagnant water. You don't just go into a puddle, jump in and jump out, and you're good. The water has to be flowing in order to carry away any diseases, any dirt, any filth. And one ancient writer, Josephus, suggests that's probably why in the first century, in his time, a lot of synagogues were built near rivers and flowing water so that people could be cleansed and then quickly go into the synagogue or go into the temple so that you weren't contaminated along the way. There's a little bit to think about with the um, story of the Good Samaritan there as well, about um, touching dead bodies and whatnot. Anyway, that's for you to think about. Um, <laughs> then we have Jesus. Of course, Jesus himself is baptized. Uh, his cousin John, known as the Baptist, is out baptizing people. Have you, ever told, have you ever stopped for a minute and thought about that? Because as Christians, right, if we think that baptism is a symbol 
of our confession of faith in Jesus as Lord and Savior, why does Jesus get baptized? Is, it's a bit, you know, if you think about it from that lens, it can be a little bit backwards, but if we think about it from that ritual purity, cleansing lens, it makes perfect sense, right? The first step before you come into contact with God and then off, offer your sacrifice is to be made clean, physically. Well, what we find, of course, in the Gospels is that Jesus' act of baptism is the first step leading, culminating in his own atoning sacrifice as the one who, forg- who is offered up for all sins. So it's actually a very deep echo of what is happening in Jewish law already. Um, so it's very, very important. When Jesus is baptized, the Gospels tell us, the Holy Spirit descends upon him in the form of a dove, and God announces, this is my son in whom I am well pleased. So for us as Christians, this is the moment where things begin to change because this, you know, th- this act of baptism takes on new meaning for us that is a little bit different to the Jewish meaning. For us, this represents a rebirth, a death to the old self and a renewal of a new life marked by God. And note as well, we'll come back to this, but the Spirit is very closely involved in baptism as well. Later on, after Jesus, a couple of generations later, baptism has become one of the key distinctive markers of Christianity, and it still is today. Um, the, The early church took baptism very, 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 very seriously. Right? To the extent where if you look through some of the ancient writings, things like the, the Didache and whatnot, um, people had to go through a long period of discernment, of testing even, um, of classes, of mentoring, of discipling, before they were allowed to be baptized. So you had to go through a whole process right, in order to become baptized. That, this continues in many traditions today. Right? They call it often something like catechism, um, or, and you're a catechumenate if you're someone who is going through that process, a, a candidate for baptism. Uh, of course, one of, the, one of the reasons for this, very, very practical, is that it helped the early church to weed out any uh, double agents, any secret spies from the Roman government who were coming in to try and destroy the Christian movement. If you put th- someone through a couple of years of sitting and listening to Christian theology, um, and make sure that they've gone through all of that before they can get baptized, and they still get baptized, you're, you're pretty sure. You're pretty sure they're okay, right? I, I, I don't think the Roman and, um, government agents were that committed, um, especially because it's a little bit, you know, dangerous to, to be baptized with spiritual powers and what have you. Anyway, so today, baptism continues to be a key moment of distinction in almost every Christian tradition. Um, in those traditions which have sacraments, these significant moments which mark a believer's journey in faith, baptism is almost always one of the seven sacraments. Right? It's very, very important. Um, for Protestants, for most Protestants, I should say, when an individual is baptized, it represents their full, consensual, knowing commitment to being a Christian, to to living as a follower of Christ, which, by the way, is why some denominations do not recognize infant baptism, because there's an element in the Protestant tradition of cognizance, of knowing what you're getting yourself into when you're baptized. When a person is immersed, as I mentioned, that represents their symbolic death to themselves, to the passions of this earth, to the world, like Jesus himself went into the waters, like Jesus himself went into the tomb. And when they come up out of the water, that represents their rebirth, their coming alive as children of God who are adopted into the family of believers. It is impossible to overstate how important this is. This is one of our most ancient, most sacred traditions. And it is very, very important But it's also very, very exciting when people decide to make this step. So today, we've actually got a couple of people who are being baptized, and we're going to do that right now, and we're all going to celebrate with them. I hope you're excited. I'm super excited. So I'll get them to come up. (laughs) 
Welcome. You can, yeah, we can stand in the middle. That'll be fun. And, yep, we'll go and get the tank ready. Excellent. Congratulations. What's your name? <coughs> Anthony. And Anthony, um, would you like to share with everyone just a little bit about your journey or, or like why you're deciding to get baptized? Sure. Um, well, my testimony starts off with just my parents. Um, very thankful for them um, for raising me up. So, yeah, so they taught me um, how to be a Christian and, you know, they showed me what it's like to be a Christian. Thanks, Anthony. Let's give him a clap. Yeah. Awesome. Um, I'm Angela. Um, uh, my testimony is long and windy, so I'll tell you the very short version. <laughs> um, I, God has been a constant in my life, and the Holy Spirit has always guided me and protected me through so many so many different trials that were sent to break me and were sent to make me less. And I know that in Christ, I am enough and that um, I always will be enough. So um, yeah, I'm really grateful and really excited to be baptised. <laughs> Amazing. Well, why don't we take a moment and as a community, lift them up in prayer. Um, so what I'll do is I'll get all of you, if you feel comfortable, uh, to stretch out your hands, symbolising that you're lifting them up in prayer and standing with them. And yeah, we'll just pray for them. Lord, we thank you for these two wonderful people, this commitment that they have decided to make and this step that they are taking. We ask that as they go into the waters and they emerge renew and refreshed, that your spirit would fall upon them, that you would bless them, that you would give them certainty of purpose, knowing that they are now and always have been and always will be full members of your family, that they are part of a community of believers who will share in their life with them. They are yours, Lord. So we thank you for them and for the step that they're about to take. In your mighty name, amen. Amen. All right, let's go over to the tank. And I'll come over as well and we'll hold the mic in so we can all hear what's going on. On the confession of your faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Into the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, through baptism, your old life is now buried with Christ. And as just as Christ has raised from the dead, through the glory of God the Father, so you will live a new life. Bless you. right now in the name of Jesus, Lord. Just thank you for Angela taking this step of faith, Lord. We just ask, Lord, that the Spirit of God would just fill her afresh, fill her anew, Lord, and empower her, Lord, to continue to live for you, to continue to walk in faith, and to continue to walk out the plan that you have for her. And we thank you for her now in Jesus' mighty name. Amen and amen. Anthony, on the confession of your faith, I baptize you in the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Spirit. Into the name of our Lord Jesus Christ, through your baptism, your old life is now buried with Christ. And just as Christ was raised from the dead, through the glory of God the Father, so you will rise and live 
your new life. Lord, we just thank you now for Anthony. We thank you. Anthony, as we were, you were about to be baptized, I just felt the, the same thing that the Father said to Jesus when he was baptized. He would say to you, you are my son whom I love in you. I am well pleased. Father, just touch Anthony now, Lord, and let that pleasure, that love that you have for him, Lord, be manifested in every moment of his life. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. How good is that? How good is it? It is wonderful to be able to celebrate together as a community when people make these significant decisions and moments. And hey, if you would like to get baptised, come and chat to one of our pastors. If you're online, email me and we'll work it out. (laughs) We'll do a virtual baptism somehow. It's an important moment. It's a significant moment. And so we encourage everyone to take that step. So, many of you here will already have been baptised. What do we do then? What's next? Well, we are a church with a deep Pentecostal heritage. And what that means is, we believe in the works of the Spirit which continue to be active in the people today. Amen? I hope so. Amen? Yes? (laughs) Uh, this doesn't come out of nowhere, all right? There are deep biblical and historical roots behind this. Um, so in Acts, we see the members of the early church, the early ecclesiae, the gathering, um, go out and they're sent to do different things, raising the dead, healing the sick, preaching to the poor, etc., etc. And through all of this, we see that what the Spirit of God does is it works through people to refresh others, to create renewal, to create new life. It's no accident that the symbols of the Spirit are things of movement. Water, oil, fire, um, wind, things that refresh, things that purify. Then, if we look through Pentecostal history, not just Pentecostal history, there are many, many examples of Spirit-led revivals happening all through history, but Pentecostalism specifically, Many of you will know or have heard about Azusa Street, a time in the early 1900s in Los Angeles in America, um, where a group of people came together seeking after God and began speaking in tongues and manifesting these different spiritual gifts. This was a time where the Spirit actually brought them together and set aside a number of different divisive things, things like class, race, age, um, you know, gender roles, in terms of like, you know, male headship and all of that. And what the Spirit led to was a very just, very egalitarian, very fair society where all people were considered equal in the Spirit. Now, this is not unique to the United States. Okay, many people will think now that that's where it comes from. Yes and no. Pentecostal historians are now uncovering that, interestingly, this happened in many different parts of the world around the same time. So in places like Kerala, in India, in places like Wales, a lot of people know about Wales now, in places like North Korea, of all places, and even here in Melbourne, in the late 1800s and the early 1900s, there were many, many movements that began experiencing this type of renewal, revival through the Spirit. The most interesting thing is, these often weren't connected at all. That these things happened spontaneously all around the same time by the Spirit. They do have two things in common. One is a group of people who got together and began praying for renewal and revival. And number two is people responding to that, being baptized and activating their faith. So if you want revival, that's what you gotta do. Pray, 
Be baptized, baptize others. Pretty simple. Let's do it. I mean, we, we, we've started doing it. We, we're doing it now. <laughs> um, and so one of the other things that we can all do and partake in is what we call spirit baptism, right? Um, as mentioned earlier, the spirit descends on Jesus when he is baptized. And later, as I said, when the disciples come together in the upper room, they're praying, the spirit falls on them and they begin doing these incredible, miraculous things. They are empowered. They are refreshed and renewed and go out to begin fulfilling their mission. Spirit baptism is the great equalizer because the spirit, there's, a, there's an odd phrase, right, which, which we use. The spirit is not a respecter of persons. The spirit doesn't care about your age, about your gender, about, you know, your class, your, your, who you think you are. God's Spirit does not make those distinctions. And what we saw historically, even today, is that the Spirit can work just as powerfully through a three-year-old girl as it can an 80-year-old man. That's exciting. Because what it means is that despite our frailties, our faults, our very, you know, our human nature, all the problems that we have, the Spirit can work through and beyond us to bring fresh life to people, to communities all around. This should be really, really exciting, by the way. <laughs> it is for me. Now, Spirit baptism is marked by a number of different things. Uh, for most people, uh, a very clear sign of the Spirit uh, baptism is speaking in tongues. Um, we see a number of other signs that can accompany Spirit baptism. Uh, you. you are probably aware of many of them, things like prophecy, teaching, wisdom, uh, the interpretation of tongues, healing, and deliverance. These are all things that we saw in the early 1900s through the different Pentecostal revivals and things that continue to this day. And in a minute, we'll take a moment and pray for all of us or those who are willing and comfortable to be spirit baptized or, or be refreshed in the spirit. And I'll get the band to come up as well, actually, the team. Here's the problem. Here's the problem. With gifts or manifestations of the power of the spirit can come some complications, very human complications, where we get a little bit competitive about these gifts. We're, oh, well, this person speaks in tongues and this person can prophesy. Wow, how anointed they are. Let's lift them up. And if we do that, we've missed the point completely. Paul writes about this very extensively. Let's not make this a competition about, you know, someone's giftings and, and how the Spirit manifests in different people. He, you know, 1 Corinthians, go and have a look through it. Let's not get hung up on who can do what. What I think is actually more important is a list of characteristics of spirit baptized people that Paul gives us. You know these well if you know the song. Love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, generosity, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control. I think we're beginning to recognize that these, more than the gifts of prophecy or tongues or what have you, these are the true indicator of the work of, a, of the Spirit in a person's life. This is what will bring about God's kingdom. We can do the flashy stuff. We can do the speaking in tongues. We can do the prophetic stuff. But what people will see is not that, right, on a day-to-day -day basis. It's the other stuff. It's the love, the joy, the patience, the kindness, the way we treat other people, not just fellow Christians, but the people in our communities, the people that we come and we engage with. Romans 12 says, present your bodies as a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable to God, which is your spiritual worship. Do not be conformed to the world, but be transformed by the renewing of your minds. The whole purpose of water baptism and of spirit baptism is to mark us as new people, people who are growing more and more into alignment with God 
every day. And so this is something that I invite and I challenge all of us to partake in. This is an important way for us to connect with God. And you know what? It should change us. It must change us. It must change us for the better. Imagine if all of us set aside, not, 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 not in a, you know, ignoring sense, but imagine if we began to prioritize the development of the fruit of the Spirit in our lives, in the way we speak with one another, in the way we engage with people in our workplaces, that we're, you know, just when we're out and about and people say something a little bit different about you. Imagine if we all became like those trees in the book of Revelation, bearing those fruit with leaves for the healing of all nations. That could be us. And it starts here, and I think it starts now. So what I'd like to invite all of us to do is, if you're in the room, I invite you to stand with me. Um, and if you're online, you can stay seated, whatever's, whatever's convenient for you. And I think if you would like to participate in this, let me invite you to stretch out your hands like this, just, just as a sign of surrender, nothing weird about it, but just a way for us to invite the Spirit to come into our lives, that we may be transformed by His Spirit. Lord, we take a moment, and we invite Your Spirit to come fall on every single one of us, we ask. Enter every one of our lives, for those who are watching, for those who are in the room, for every single person. Transform us, renew us, refresh us. Help us every day to be made more and more into your image, that we can be people who represent you and your kingdom wherever we walk, wherever we go. Lord, fill us to overflowing so that you may spill out of us onto all the people we come into contact with, that they too would be refreshed, renewed, transformed by encountering you in us. Thank you, Lord. And we pray the prayer of Irenaeus, who says that the glory of God is humanity fully alive and the life of humanity is seeing God. May we see you. May we have you dwell in us. We're going to take a moment and just respond by singing this, um, this bridge a couple of times. So again, you know, let me invite you to stay standing, stay in this posture. We'll just sing this a couple of times. And I'll come up and I'll pray and I'll close. Oh, oh, oh. 
by your spirit let us be like trees planted by the waters who bear fruit who heal the nations let us go from here as your people heralding your coming kingdom in the mighty name of Jesus Amen Amen Amen